I'm excited to teach tonight. My seven-year-old son, Israel, has a huge man crush on um, this Mr. Moser here. I, he talks about him all the time, wants to be just like him. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn to Genesis 1. If you did not get the notes, raise your hand. My wonderful, beautiful assistant will pass those notes out to you. There's also pens and pencils available as well. Um, we're going to read from Genesis 1, um, but I'm going to pray again. And if you haven't filled out kind of like the what you already know thing, do that now. It says below, write out a short synops- synopsis of the, the Bible. Uh, you can do that as I pray. Well, Jesus, we're so thankful to dig into Scripture. This evening, we love your word. Jesus, we love the opportunity to read about you, to know about you. And we love, Jesus, that you have made yourself known to us, that Yahweh has made himself known to us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And so tonight we ask that you would send Holy Spirit and he would minister to us, that he would send Holy Spirit to take the things of Jesus and give them to us, that the gospel, Father, would be in our hearts, that the gospel would be our hope, that we would love your word, that we would love the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, God, that you would work with us. We pray that Jesus gets all the glory, all the honor, and and, um, all worship, because he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and we love you, Jesus. We love you. We ask that you would help us, be with us. In the name of Jesus, amen. So hopefully you, you guys have written down a few sentences Because I just want to ask ahead of time. Raise your hands if you wrote something about um, the forgiveness of sins. All right. Uh, Something about the cross. Good, good. A few handful of people. Uh, Something about heaven, going to heaven. Okay. Be a little shy, maybe. Is that what's going on here? You guys can can do it. Um, About uh, the avoidance of hell. Anybody have something about that? Okay, how about uh, the phrase, the day of the Lord? Anybody write something about the day of the Lord? All right, we got one. Bible nerd, you Bible nerd? Right on, man, okay. How about the resurrection of the dead? Not just Jesus' resurrection, but the actual resurrection of the dead. Anybody got that phrase in there somewhere? Kind of? All right, I love it. How about, um, what else did I, oh, the restoration of all things. Anybody include the restoration of all things in the gospel message. You do? Come on. You guys are like the all-stars, man. How about something about the kingdom? All right, we got a kingdom person over there. Okay, all right, I'm excited to go through with this. Maybe by the time I'm done, you guys are going to be like, duh, we already knew all that stuff. But we're going to start with the word gospel, the word, oh, did anybody, there's always one, one person. Did anybody write just good news? Okay, there's always like one, right? Like, I, like I, I'm a high school teacher, so I'm like, all right, I got this assignment that they're supposed to do for like seven minutes, and there's one kid's like, done, I'm done. It's like, <laughs> Never mind, though, you guys are not like that. Okay, so we want to talk about gospel. It means good news or glad tidings. Um, and I've just found over the years of teaching the Bible, if you really want to drill down on a topic, you got to go to Genesis. And, and usually Genesis 1 through 3. So open your books to, to your Bibles to Genesis 1. And real quick, just, just follow along with me because we're going to talk about just what is good, right? Before we talk about the good news, what is good and who gets to decide what is good? So verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We'll skip down to verse 10. And the earth called the dry land earth and the, the gathering together of the waters called he sees, and God saw that it was good. Okay, so God says these things are good. His creation is good. Continuing on to verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass and herb herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Verse 18, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Verse 21, And God created great whales. Whales are good. Do you guys know whales are good? Whales are good. And every living creature that moveth, which 
which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Verse 25. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Verses 26 now through 31. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every fruit tree and, and every tree in, the, in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat. And every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. We'll stop there. What's... What's the good news? Let's just start with what's good. And, and God gets to decide what's good. And he says what's good is his creation. The trees and the rocks and the water and the animals are good. And what's very good? Human beings as mediators ruling over his creation. He calls that very good. Do we catch the first big points right away? Because we want to we talk about what the good news is. God gets to decide what's good. It's his covenant of creation. Jeremiah 33 makes it clear that he's making some sort of pact with creation. They're good. I don't know the, the, the stipulations of the covenant, but there is a covenant going on. He loves his creation. Letter B here. No, letter A. He also makes a covenant with Adam. Hosea 6, Psalm 115. Blessed is the Lord God. The, the heavens belong to our Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. What, at, what Adam and Eve were meant to be were mediators. And they were meant to mediate God's creation to him and God back to creation. That's, that's the phrase when it says he blessed them. That word blessed is the word barak, and it means to bend the knee. And it just means it's a governmental context. It means that he's giving Adam and Eve authority in the garden. Over, over his creation. And when we think of being blessed, most of us think of like celebrities, right? And they, they have like 15 cars and 12, 12 pools and they're like, yeah, hashtag blessed, right? But that's not the context of the scriptures. The scripture is a governmental context, meaning that you have authority. The Lord is giving authority to Adam and Eve in the garden as, as his mediators. And that's how he blessed them. Governmental mediators. So conclusions about what is good, his creation is good. And, and we, as, we as 21st century Gentiles, we have to fight against something called Platonism, which believes that there's two realities. There's like the, the earthly reality, and then there's the ethereal reality. And one's inherently good, and one's inherently bad. Or what Randy Alcorn in his book Heaven calls Christoplatonism, which tries to combine Christianity with Plato and Greek thought, and try to, try to make the two mold together, and they don't fit. So right away, let's catch this big things, right? God's creation is good, and he's committed to it. Adam and Eve's responsibility, their authority in the garden, is very good, and he's committed to that as well. Okay, so sometimes to understand what is good, you got to talk about what is bad. Let's take a look at what is bad. It's called understanding through negation. What, what do we know is bad? Treason in the garden. Chapter 3 of Genesis. The tree is called the knowledge of good and evil. And we understand this in a governmental context. Because when Adam and Eve take the fruit, some people think, oh, they are just so tempted. Like me, right? I'm tempted by like the donut at church. And I, was like, I just can't help it. I'm going to eat it. But for them, it's not just, oh, this tastes really good. This is, this is the knowledge of the, the tree of good and evil. And when Satan says to them, he doesn't say, this, apple's, or this fruit's going to taste really good, man. He says, you eat this and you'll be like God. Why? Because it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's who gets to decide what's good and who gets to decide what's evil. 
This is the point of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When, when they take from that tree, they're saying, I don't want this king to be my king. I don't want him to rule over me. I want to decide what's good and what's evil for me. I want to decide what's good and, and, and bad for everything. Do you understand? When, he, when they take the, apple, the fruit from the tree, they are committing treason, saying, I will not have this king rule over me. I don't want God. Do you guys understand the context there? That's bad. That's treason. That's rejecting the governmental, that's rejecting the blessing that the Lord had given them. Do you catch it? Okay, so what happens? The consequences thereof. This is the curse, right? Conclusions about what is bad. The consequences thereof are pain, relational problems, a cursed creation. The ground is cursed, the thorns are cursed, the thistles are cursed, difficult production. And now here's the main part of the curse, death. Take your pencil, circle death. Death is the main part of the curse. When you think of God's curse on, on humanity, on the earth, it's death is the main part of, of, of what's going on here. And all those consequences that came with man's rebellion, before he even dis- says all those things, right? When he tells Adam, from dust I took you and dust you'll go back to the earth. Before then, he gives them what's called the first gospel. And it's a famous thing, it's called the proto-evangelium. It doesn't matter if you don't know what that means, it just means the first gospel. The first time the good news is being preached. And it comes in Genesis 3.15. If you have your Bibles in front of you still, take a look at it. We can start at verse 14. This is the curse on the snake. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt eat all the days. Dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, verse fourteen, we have the curse on the snake where he'll have to eat or lick dust, and that language is sprinkled out throughout the whole Bible. If you have eyes to see it, you'll see that over and over and over again. Do you guys know what Joshua did when he took those kings after, he's, after the sun stood still in the sky for a while? Do you know what he did with the kings that he found hiding in caves? Anybody know? He took them out, and he put them on his belly like the snake, right? And then he had his generals come over, and guess what they did? They put their feet on their heads of those kings, and then he slaughtered them. Why did he do that? What a random thing to do, right? No, he's, he's referencing the curse. It, it's a, it's a, a typological symbol of what's to come. And if you look, if you have eyes to see it, you'll see that language throughout the scriptures. Verse 15, number two here, enmity or hatred between the seeds. So he's speaking to, uh, he's speaking to Satan about Eve, and he says, out of you, Out of Eve, Satan, will come a seed. And that seed, though you will strike its heel, it will smash your head. And the language here is uh, is the Hebrew word zira, which is collective singular, and it's also masculine. So seed and offspring can be referring to one thing, or it can be um, something bigger, like deer or fish, right? If I say deer, you have to know the context, whether I'm talking about one deer or many deer. The same thing with seed as well. Genesis um, and then letter B, the wounded heel and the smashed head. So the reference is, you will deliver an early non-fatal wound, and the language is at the heel, but he will deliver a later fatal wound, and the language is at the head. Do you guys see the context of Genesis 3.15? It is what's going to set up the drama for the rest of the Bible. It's how we understand what's happening, is Genesis 3.15. It's the first gospel, and it sets up the rest of the scene. It's going to give you the rest of the story. It's going to give you that, that idea. So then gen- number three here, Genesis 3.15 in context with verses 16 through 19 is reversing the curse. So when, when, when the seed comes, when the Messiah comes, when this king comes to smash Satan's head, he's going to reverse the curse. What were the curses? Well, remember, we, we have them here in number two under letter B. Pain, relational problems, curse creation. And what was the main one? Somebody tell me. Death. So when the seed comes, how will he reverse the curse? With life, with the opposite of it, right? And that's why in Genesis 3.20, Adam calls his, his wife Eve. 
Eve means, um, it actually says in Genesis, I'll make sure I get it right. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. He says that immediately after verse 19, his death. Out of Eve will come the seed that will bring life. Do you guys catch it? And if somebody's already dead, how do you bring life to somebody that's already dead? Starts with an R. Tell it to me. Resurrection. All right, so you guys are starting to see the context, right? We're talking about the good news. We got to drill down right to the, to the basics. We've talked about what is good. We've talked about the first gospel, Genesis 3.15. Now let's talk a little bit more about this because this is like a seed that's been planted into the ground. And in, in, in throughout the scriptures, that little seedling is going to grow. And it's going to grow and it's going to develop until we get to the New Testament. Let's, let's find it. Let's watch it grow. First of all, anybody know what Christ means? It's a Greek word. It's the, same, it's the same word in Hebrew called Messiah. Anybody know what Messiah or Christ means? It doesn't mean deliverer. Good one, though. I like it. The anointed one. Did you look on the notes or did you know it? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, it, it means anointed one. It means somebody that gets their oil pointed on their head, poured on their head. And you see it out throughout Scripture for prophets, priests, and especially kings. It happens. Now the question is, anointed for what? Because when, when Samuel found David on the backside of the hill and put oil on his head, was it just to make David's hair smell good? Or did it have a bigger purpose to it? What was the bigger purpose between Sam, for Samuel to pour oil on David's head? What was he doing? He just wanted David's hair to smell good? Yeah, he was anointing him as king. You are now the king, not Saul. And he doesn't become king for a number of years. But it has, it has a bigger, deeper meaning. The same way if, if my wife and I were at a restaurant and we saw a young man put on his knees and put a ring on somebody's, on a young lady's finger, right? We wouldn't think to ourselves, oh, that's really sweet. He gave her a ring, right? We, we would think, oh, there's something bigger going on. Like, they're going to they're gonna get married, right? The same picture of the anointing. It has this big prophetic meaning behind it. This is what anointed one means. When you say that you love Christ, you're saying, I love the anointed one. I love the one who's appointed. Well, he's anointed for what? Let's find out. He's the seed of Abraham. The genealogy of Genesis 4 through 12 is following the story of the seed. Who's going who's gonna to be the seed? Who's going to bear the seed? Okay, we got two sons, Cain and Abel. Which one will it be? Well, in a few, a few verses, you realize it's definitely not Abel because what? He's dead. And what happened to Cain? What is he? He's an outcast. He's a murderer. Well, okay. Cain's definitely not the seed. Abel's not the seed. Seth. You guys know what Seth means? The substitute. Why did she name her kid Seth? Oh, maybe he'll be the seed. But then you follow all along the genealogy of Seth. None of those guys are the seeds. And there's two righteous people in the genealogy of Seth. There's there's Noah and there's Enoch, but neither of those guys are the seeds. And then the flood comes, and it's a picture of the day of the Lord. And then we can keep on following the story with Noah's sons. Some of the sons are cursed. Some of the sons are blessed. You're like, Who, who's going to be the seed? Who's going to carry the seed? And then you get to Abraham. And Abraham is a direct answer to Babel. Because at Babel, they all, all the, the people get together, and they say, we're going to build a kingdom. God says, no, I'm not gonna, I, don't do, I, don't, I don't work that way. And he chooses Abraham, and Abraham says, I'm going to wait for the kingdom. You guys catch the difference? This is the story of the seed. We'll continue then. The drama of the seed goes with Isaac. Is Isaac ever going to have kids? Well, he eventually does. He has twins, Jacob and Esau. Which one's it going to be? It seems like Esau, right? Because he's hairy, and he's like a hunter. Like, yeah, this is my dude. No, it's, it's, it's Jacob, the deceiver, the, the, like the mama's boy. He's the one that, that the Lord chooses. And, and then Jacob has 12 sons. Who's the seed going to be? It's Judah. And Judah's kind of a sketchy guy. But, but when you look at the, the prophecy of Genesis 49, when Jacob prophesies over Judah, it's got the language of Genesis 3.15. And it adds some things. And this is where I said, remember, that it's like a seed and it's growing. And here, Genesis 49, things take a new turn because the language of Genesis 49 
has some new things in it. It has kingly language. That the seed will be a lawgiver. That the seed is going to have a scepter. That he's a lion. He's a lawgiver. So now we have a new thing. It turns out that this seed that we've been waiting for, that we've been watching grow and we've been following the genealogy, he's going to be a king. Remember what Christ means? The anointed one. Anointed for what? Letter C. He's anointed to rule. And then we get to Balaam's prophecy. In Numbers 24, he's, he's paid money to curse the Israelites and instead he blesses them and he gives them a prophecy about the Messiah. And in that language, again, we have kingly language. He's a star, but he's far off, and he has a scepter. He's a ruler. Hannah's prayer. Do you know the first person to ever say the word Messiah in Scripture is Hannah? I love that about the Scriptures. So she drops her son Samuel off to Eli, and she just has this song, and she says in the, in the phrase, I don't know, did I include it here? Yeah, he will give strength to his king, and he will exalt the horn of his anointed. That word anointed is Messiah. It's the first time in Scripture that it's used. But we're following the, the and it's the picture of a bull, right? You got a bull, got two horns, and he lifts one up. He's, an, he's exalting the horn of the anointed. The language continues in Nathan's prophecy to David in 2 Samuel 7. He says, From your body will come a seed who will sit on your throne forever and establish an eternal kingdom. With David, it gets much, much more serious. He's a king, he's a human, but he's going to establish a kingdom that's eternal. What kind of a king is this? What kind of a man is this? He will forever sit on David's throne in Jerusalem? And the picture of the Messiah grows. Are you guys following me? You're with me? Okay, let's keep going. Letter D. By the time you get to the New Testament you understand that the divine agent is the Messiah, and he's the ultimate mediator of redemptive history. And it's this wonderful contrast in the Old and New Testament because in the Old Testament, only God is going to do the day of Yahweh. Only God is going to save his people. Only God is going to save, judge the earth. Only God is going to redeem creation. But then you get these hints that actually his Messiah is going to do all that. The Messiah is like his mediator. It's like his, his divine agent. So he's going to carry out Yahweh's responsibilities. Letter A, the Messiah will execute the day of the Lord. Psalm 110, and I'm not going to read all these verses. My goal, and maybe this is, can, can be the challenge, is maybe you guys can get together with a few others and start looking at these verses and actually like go through them and see what, see what it's connecting. Be a good Berean and see if these things are true. So, only the, so now the Messiah is going to execute the day of the Lord. It is such a dramatic change in the New Testament where it starts saying, instead of the day of the Lord, it says the day of Christ. I love that. It's, it's the day of Jesus. That uh, the Christ will save the people. The Messiah will judge the earth. The Christ will redeem creation. Conversely, those who reject the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, reject God. You can look at those verses. So now, to, just to wrap up, okay, we've followed, the, we've followed just a tiny little bit for the time that we have. <laughs> I gotta go faster. I, you think I'm speaking fast, right? But I only got like 20 minutes left, so I gotta go quicker. We, we've seen the seed growing, right? We're watching it grow, and we get to the point where we're like, okay, this, this is the gospel. This is the good news, that there is going to come a seed from a woman who's gonna be a king, and he's gonna establish a, a throne, and he's gonna have a kingdom. You guys catch me? You guys following me? And just to throw it in there, it's like an eternal kingdom. But there's some other good news that's kind of like on the side here. And, and, and it's not really on the side, but it's like two parallel stories. We have the gospel of the Christ, and then we also have the gospel of Yahweh's appearing. And we'll get to that right now. Number three, the gospel of Yahweh's appearance. Jesus the cloud rider. I, w- I can't wait. One day I'm going to teach a message called Jesus the cloud rider. And I'm just going to work slowly through all these scriptures, not as fast. It's going to be fun. Okay, so you guys know the story, right? He, the, um, Moses takes out, God takes out the people from Egypt, and God shows them where to go, and he's a cloud by day and a fire by night, right? We know that story. And, and as you read the Exodus, it it starts to give personalization to the cloud. Like, he's not just, it's not just a random cloud, but it's like, 
Well, sometimes it calls it the angel of the Lord. Other times it just says the Lord, the Lord is in the cloud. The, the Lord is the cloud. And so you're kind of like, what, what's going on here? And then you get to Sinai, where, where they established the law. And, and the Lord descends onto Sinai. And it's clouds and thunder and storms. And they set around a boundary so that nobody gets close to it, or even an animal. And it's, it's, it's clouds, right? And then you have the glory cloud that comes down on, onto the ark. And the priest can't even stand up. Solomon says his prayer. The glory comes down. People go, go flat on the ground. So, so that's, that's kind of like when God came once, his appearance. But the prophets in the book of Psalms start prophesying about another appearance. And I have all these here. Psalm 18, Psalm 68, Psalm 104, Isaiah 2, 24, 25, 59. And it talks about Yahweh is coming, and he's coming on a cloud. And it's not a light, fluffy cloud. It's like a storm cloud, right? You guys ever seen a picture of Jesus like, in like, like a light, fluffy cloud? I'm like, oh, that looks kind of, it, it, it's not like that. It's like a storm cloud. It's like fear. It's like lightning. It's like t- take cover because he's coming back. Um, and then we get to Isaiah 40 or Malachi 3. Take your Bibles, open them to Isaiah 40, please. Isaiah 40 is so important because of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all make a big deal out of Isaiah 40. And Isaiah 40 has the phrase, the Gospel. The good news. So Isaiah 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, and the rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries out and says, What shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, there it is, gospel. You who bring the gospel to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms, and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have the young. The good news. Yahweh's coming. Get ready. Make the, make the valleys, raise them up, lower the plains. He's coming. And then this is why when we get to the New Testament, the gospel writers, before they even begin Jesus' public ministry, they all point to John the Baptist as the voice in the wilderness. And they have a fourfold proclamation of that. First of all, the angel says to Zechariah, his son, your boy is, the, is the, the voice from Isaiah 40. John himself, John the Baptist says it himself, I'm the voice, I'm not the Messiah, I'm the one from Isaiah 40 saying, get ready, here he comes. Jesus himself says, no, John is the voice from Isaiah 40, and the gospel writers tell us that he is. Why is it so important for them? Because we cannot read about Jesus until we understand who he is. If John the Baptist is the voice saying Yahweh is coming, who is Jesus? Say it again. He's Yahweh. You guys understand? When we read the gospels, we're not meant to be like, I wonder who this Jesus is. Maybe we'll figure out as we go along. No, right at the very beginning, the, the gospel writers are saying, this is Yahweh. John the Baptist is, te- is the one who's, who's telling us about Yahweh. He's the voice from Isaiah 40. Therefore, Jesus of Nazareth is Yahweh. The good news of the appearing of Jesus, in a, or the appearing of Yahweh, is found in the man, Jesus of Nazareth. Let's keep going. 
I lost my spot. Verse 9, behold your God. Verse 10, Yahweh comes with a strong hand. His reward is with him, but he's a gentle shepherd. Letter D, the coming cloud rider is also the Christ. Let's turn to Daniel 7. Because up until this point, those two parallel stories are growing up in scriptures. The story of the Messiah, who's going to be the anointed one, and at the same time, the story of Yahweh's appearing. And with Daniel 7, guess what they do? They combine. That it's the same person. Daniel 7. What do I have here? Verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and therefore, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. There it is. There's the clouds. He's coming. It's Yahweh's appearance on a cloud. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Yahweh dwells in inapproachable light. Who can just come into his presence? Jesus can, right? He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men every lang- in every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. He's a king. He's going to have a kingdom that never ends, and he's also Yahweh. Those two seeds that are growing up in scriptures have combined, and now when we get to the person of Jesus, we need to know who he is. So the question tonight, actually, let me keep talking a little bit more here. Number three, Psalm 110 is the most quoted New Testament, Old Testament scripture in the New Testament, where it says, the Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh said to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. A human being sits on Yahweh's universal throne. Somebody like us, somebody with hands and feet and a nose, sits on the eternal throne. This is a big deal. And this is why in Acts 2, Peter makes such a, he, the, the thrust of his first sermon is to say, Jesus is the Christ, and he proves that from Psalm 16 and his resurrection, and Jesus is Yahweh, and he proves that from Psalm 110 because he sits at the right hand, and only Yahweh can sit on Yahweh's throne. So our question tonight, (laughs) our question tonight, right, was what is the gospel? But it actually should have been who is the gospel? Because we can talk about good things. We can talk about the cross, right? And we will eventually get there. But unless you know who is up on that cross, it means nothing. That's why we cannot have communion with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons because they say it's not God on the cross. And if it's not divine blood that's spilled on the cross, it does nothing for you. It will not go well for you at the day of the Lord. Do you see this? Jesus is Yahweh. This is his promise. Okay, so now, now that we've answered the question, who is the gospel? Let's go now to what is the gospel? So we can answer these questions. What is is the gospel of Jesus the Christ the Lord? What has he done? What is he doing? What will he do? And I, I wrote out these five things. You could probably put them, make it six or seven, and they're all interrelated, and I couldn't figure out which one to do first, so I started with my favorite, the gospel of the resurrection. Number one, the same breath, spirit, wind, the Hebrew word ruah, that animated creation at the beginning, you can look at those verses later, is the same voice that spoke those words, that it's, it's the same voice that spoke those words to create, is the same that currently sustains creation. So in the beginning, he, he makes everything. How does he make it? By speaking it, right? And then when he forms Adam, Adam is a fully formed human being, but how does God bring life to him? What does he do? You guys remember the story? He breathes on him. And Adam opens his eyes, right? This is the same word as spirit, breath, wind, Was there another one as well in there? Voice, right? And so, and and not only does, and he's not a watchmaker. So so God didn't make creation and then kind of like watch it go, right? He actually makes creation and he sustains it actively. The, The reason you're alive right now is because God is, it's his breath that's in your lungs, right? You guys agree? Okay, continuing on. Number two, Jesus Christ the Lord will use that same voice, word, breath, wind, spirit to resurrect the dead. I love that in John 5 where he says, 
The Son of Man is coming, and he, will, and he will speak to the dead, and the dead will raise. Jesus of Nazareth is coming back, and with his voice, he's going to raise the dead. And, and here we go back to, to the, um, the curse, right? Remember what you guys circled? What was the main part of the curse? Death. Okay, so what's, what's the main part of the blessing that's going to come? The result of the seed, the result of the seed smashing the serpent's head, life. How does he bring life to the dead? Through resurrection. That's why he's known as the firstborn from the dead. We see that over and over again in the New Testament. He's the first one to come out of the tomb with a resurrected body. And he's evidence, if, if, he's came, if he'd come out of the grave, then we will as well. That's why later on they call him the first fruits. Like the harvest is there, you take the apple and you eat it. You're like, hmm, this is good. And then you're reminded, oh yeah, at the harvest, I'm going to get a lot of apples. That's how he's the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead. And the Holy Spirit is the deposit guaranteeing our future resurrection. Why do I have so much confidence that he's going to resurrect me from the dead? Because the Holy Spirit ministers me, to me daily, and he should to you as well, right? I sin, and he, he won't let me go. He just convicts me of my sin until I confess it. Or I get to enjoy the fruits of the Holy Spirit, or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He is the deposit guaranteeing my future resurrection. That's why we can have so much confidence. Conclusions. Take a look at these verses. First Corinthians 15, Acts 17, Ezekiel 37, Psalm 16, Daniel 12. Death does not win. You were never meant to die. and One day you won't. Resurrection life is the end of your story. That's where it's going. You're going to get resurrected if you're found in the sacrifice. Letter B, the gospel of the kingdom. We talked about how the Messiah is a king, prophesied that way. A king must have a kingdom. What is it that John the Baptist and Jesus, pro, uh, what, what is it that they're preaching? If you ask a, a general Christian on the street and say, what was like the main message that Jesus is preaching? They're going to say love, maybe sacrifice, maybe humility. There's really only one, because everything else fits under there. The main message that they're preaching is the kingdom. There is a kingdom coming. And this one might be the most controversial thing I say tonight. So be ready for that. Be merciful to me, okay? What, what kind of kingdom is it? It's a messianic kingdom. It's an inherited kingdom at the day of the Lord. It's a future kingdom. We, as 21st century Gentiles, we don't get to decide what kingdom means. We don't get to say, well, actually, it's just a kingdom in my heart. By saying that, we're saying that the, the Old Testament prophecies are not true. No, there's a coming king. He will have a kingdom. It will be on the earth. The Messiah will reign on David's throne in Jerusalem, establishing a kingdom forever. The, gospel, the message is clear in the scriptures. The Old Testament has been prophesying a future glorious kingdom where the Messiah sits on the throne in Jerusalem and his glory goes out from, from Israel and then to the nations. Psalm 2, Psalm 110, etc., etc. Jesus, John the Baptist, and the rest of the New Testament do not teach a new sort of ethereal kingdom. Rather, the lack of commentary in the New Testament argues for an unaltered Jewish apocalyptic eschatological view of the kingdom. Your job is not to build the kingdom. Your job is to make disciples that can go into that future kingdom. You guys catch it? There's a huge difference because so many people think, well, no, we, we got we to have more buildings and more staff and we got to have more website clicks. No, we got to make more disciples. That's it. It's very simple. Bring people into that future kingdom. Let's continue. Then what is the content of their preaching about the kingdom? If it's not a, a new realized kingdom, then what are they preaching about? The where, the who, the how, and the when. Where is it? Well, it's just like the, the, the Oval Office and then the White House and then Washington, D.C. and then all of the United States. Similarly, this kingdom will be rooted in, on David's throne, in Jerusalem, in Israel, over all the earth until the glory of the Lord covers the... All of a sudden, I lost it. Until the glory of the Lord covers the waters like the sea. Somebody help me. Nobody can help me. Until the... Say it, Arlen. 
<laughs> until the... Thank you very much. Yes. Until the earth is filled with the glory of the Lord until the, like the waters cover the sea. I was good at saying that earlier when I was practicing. I don't know what happened here. <laughs> Letter E. Uh, who? Who's going to be in the kingdom? Jews and Gentiles. Yet it's still centered in, in Jerusalem through Israel through what's called primogeniture. It just means the firstborn rights. It's the reason why Paul goes to the synagogues each time. Letter C. How will the kingdom come? It will not come with human power. And that is very clear in Scripture. It will, will come with fire, clouds, lightning, a loud trumpet, power, great glory, holy angels, and the appearance of Jesus. How does one gain interest into the kingdom? Not by ethnicity, nor by doing wondrous works, not only just by belief in God, but rather repentance, bearing fruits of repentance in belief in the Messiah's sacrifice, the divine blood spilt on the cross. When does the kingdom come? At the day of the Lord. Because Jesus is waiting for the moment he will make his enemies his, his footstool. Letter C, the gospel of the restoration. Let's read this one together too. I'm officially out of time. Raise your hands if you want me to sit down. All right, all right. I'm going to go till 8 then. Wait, it's already 8. I'll go till 9 then. Shouldn't have, somebody should have raised their hand. Acts chapter 3. This is Peter's second sermon. He has uh, healed the man at the gate, and now they want to know what's going on. Let's pick up the story on verse 17, chapter X3, verse 17. Now, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. And this is referencing what they did to Jesus. They killed him. But this is how God fulfilled what he has foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Christ would suffer. Repent then. And turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out so that the times of refreshing may come for the Lord. And I want to keep going, but I want to stop there just for a second. That times of refreshing is a really difficult uh, translation. It's a really difficult Greek phrase. And if you look in different versions of the Bible, they all translate a little bit different. This is the NIV where it says times of refreshing. That, that phrase literally means until the time of the recovery of breath, which is a weird way to say it, right? What what does that mean, the time of the recovery of breath? But you guys just worked through me with the gospel of the resurrection. How is he going to resurrect the dead? With his breath, right? So what what is Peter saying here? Repent, turn to God so your sins would be wiped out, and that the times of refreshing may come, the recovery of breath may come, the resurrection of the dead may come from the Lord. And he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus, He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. Or some versions will say, the restoration of all things. God is not going to death star the earth. How do I know that? How can I say that in such confidence? Because what was good? Do you guys remember from Genesis 1? What did he say was good? Good, 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 very good. What was it? His creation. He is committed to his creation. He's not going to destroy it. He's going to restore it, which is why Romans 8, it says all of creation is waiting and groaning. Why? Because it's been subjected to the effects of the fall, frustration and decay from verses 20 to 21, but it waits for the redemption of our bodies, the glorious freedom of the revealing of the sons of God. What Adam was meant to be and what you were meant to be and what Jesus is going to restore us to be, what you will be as a glorious mediator between Yahweh and his creation partnering with him and his kingdom, mediating his creation. This is such joy, you guys. The the beginning of the story will become the end. That's why if you want to study eschatology, you study the beginning of things, because that's where it's going. Matthew 19. Peter says, hey, Jesus, we left all. What about us? What are we going to get? And he says, yes, at the palingenesia, at the renewal of all things, at the regenesis, you guys are going to sit on 12 thrones in that kingdom and, and be ruling over all of Israel. This, this is like a big deal for Jesus, right? It's restoration. It's he's paying attention to every part of your life, and at the day of the Lord, he's going to restore things. How many of us have been, have, the enemy has taken things from us, right? Innocence taken things from us. Jesus sees that 
and he's going to restore it. And that's, that calms my soul like nothing else. That calms my anxiety like nothing else. He sees it. He's going to address it. He never sweeps injustice under the rug. For him, he's passionate about it, and he will deal with it perfectly, restoring to you what you've lost, what the enemy has taken from you. Your restoration at the day of the Lord. And I'm, st- I'm stuck right now on Genesis 49. There's a, a, well, we talked about Genesis 49 already. It's when Jacob is prophesying over, over Judah, and he, he talks about this Messiah that's coming, and he says, he will tie his donkey to a grapevine. Now, for years, I'm like, well, what in the world is that about? And I was like, well, maybe the donkey in the age to come will just be like so obedient that a little tiny grapevine. But that's actually not it because he has all these references to wine. And if you study um, first century Jewish writings, they're talking all about Eden. And it actually is referring to a massive grapevine. <laughs> I once saw my uncle tied a horse to a, one of those 70s metal slides, right? And almost ripped the thing out. Donkeys and horses are strong. In, in the age to come, you guys are going to tether one to a grapevine. <laughs> There's that amazing verse in Amos. I have this down somewhere. It says that the reapers are going to overtake the plowmen. That means, that means like, okay, we're planting the seeds, right? We're, we're plowing the ground, planting the seeds, and the reapers are like, come on, hurry up, <laughs> because the plants are growing that fast. This is the restoration of the earth. Do you guys see why this is good news? This is going to be amazing. Come on. And there's so much scripture in, this, in that area. Psalm 96, 126, Isaiah 11. Look at them and let them feed your soul. Letter D, the gospel of the day of the Lord. This is the one that probably has the most verses, and I just I ran out of space and time. Real quick. The two-age framework. I'm sorry. There's only two ages in Scripture, this present evil age and the age to come. And there's lots of people that will be like, well, no, there's the church age and there's the age of the apostles. None of that's helpful because the Scripture is very clear. This present evil age, which we're all in now, and then there's there's the age to come. Or sometimes it'll say in Scripture the endless ages. And there's one massive event that separates those two things. It's called the day of the Lord, the day of his appearance. It's the framework to understand our reality and how we should understand the cross. So Hebrews 9 says he came the first time to bear sin, the second time to bring salvation. How is he going to bring salvation? He's going to resurrect the dead. He's going to restore all things. He's going to establish a kingdom that never ends. And finally, the cross. Most of you, when I talked about what, what you did at the beginning, most people had something about the cross, the forgiveness of sins. Good. Amen. But here's the context of the cross, right? Who is Jesus? Who is Yahweh? We get the whole context now. And it's extremely good news or extremely bad news of the resurrection, the kingdom, the restoration, the day, right? Because if you reject the cross of Christ, if you reject that divine blood, then when he comes to resurrect the dead, he resurrects you, but do you know what he does with you? He throws you into a lake of fire outside of Jerusalem that will never stop burning. That's not good news, right? You must put your trust in the, the, the blood of Jesus. Otherwise, it's bad news. The same thing with the gospel of the kingdom. Actually, if you look at some of the, the preaching in the, in the gospels about the kingdom, it's a lot of times negative. It's like the kingdom's coming, therefore repent. That's bad news. You, you don't want to be an enemy of the kingdom on that day. The same way with the gospel of the restoration. He does not restore for you if you reject the blood of Jesus. The gospel of the day of the Lord. The, gospel, the day of the Lord is fearful for believers because he's going he's gonna to make a judgment on how you stewarded things. Not judgment on heaven or hell in that moment if you believe in Jesus, but, but judgment on, on how you were a steward of what the Lord gave you. And it's a fearful thing for me. And it should be for you as well, believer or unbeliever. But if you're an unbeliever, the day of the Lord is terrifying. That's why those kings in Revelation 6, they want to bury themselves under the the caves and they're like, mountains fall on us because we can't handle the wrath of the Lamb. All these things are bad news for you without the blood of Jesus. The drama of the garden is who can make it right. Remember in the beginning we talked about Adam and Eve, right? They committed treason 
when they took that fruit. And for, for the Lord, human beings have sinned. Human beings have blown it. Therefore, a human being must make it right. But no human being can. They're all sinners. Only Yahweh is true and right and good. So what does he do? God becomes a man. He makes the sacrifice for himself. And that's the good news for us because it's the substitution. The just for the unjust. The sinless one for sinners. The scapegoat. The Passover land. Propitiation, which is the appeasement of righteous, kingly wrath. Justification, being declared innocent on that day. Redemption, the payment price for the release of you. The ransom payment. Sorry I went so long. What's... What's your homework tonight? What's your challenge? Dig into the scriptures I list here. Don't just let it go. Actually look through it. Actually feed your soul on these things. What is good? What is bad? Look at Genesis 1 through 3. Think about the cross in the day of the Lord. Because that is the bruising of the heel. It's the cross. That is the smashing of the head. That's the day of the Lord. And those two events will, will ground you in all of scripture. And they'll ground you in your life. You blow it. You've sinned. You go to the cross. Somebody's, somebody's mistreated you. You trust in the day of the Lord. That Jesus sees it and he knows it. And with those two things, you will be grounded. With those two, th- two things, you can stay on this, the straight and narrow. The cross and the day of the Lord. Trust in the resurrection, the coming king, the restoration of all things. Repent, believe the gospel, and be a witness to those things. In in you have the answers. When you talk to people about what they're going through, remind them of the resurrection. Somebody's just lost a loved one, go preach to them the gospel of the resurrection. Somebody's been mistreated, you preach to them the gospel of the day of the Lord. Somebody's been, been robbed of their innocence, you preach to them the gospel of the restoration of all things. Do you guys see how the answer is in the gospel? In all these things. Somebody sinned and they think they can't, they can't ever be made right, you preach to them the gospel of the cross because the blood of Jesus is powerful. Amen, Maranatha.